today. Thank you, Sylvan, for having us. Hey, so uh, first of all, congratulations on, on your filing of, of XSL in the US and EU. And obviously, a lot of people are interested in, in what that entails and, and how the launch will be. And I think you've discussed that uh, in the recent months uh, in plenty of detail. So maybe I just want to have a big picture question. What do you think it means for the company and, and the field of, of CRISPR gene editing? Yeah, I think it's a very exciting time in the field of CRISPR. If you, if you think about the technology itself, it was elucidated in 2011 by Manuel Charpentier and Jennifer Doudna. That was not too long ago. Uh, and in less than a dozen years, we're at the cusp of taking that technology and making a medicine that's available commercially to patients. And that is a very rapid technology cycle. You know, if you've looked at other biomedical innovations or revolutions in the past, whether it's antibodies or proteins, you know, they all took a lot longer to come to fruition. Um, and so it just speaks to the power of the CRISPR technology, the facile nature of it, the flexibility you have with the technology, but also the convergence of CRISPR technology with everything else to support it, whether it's delivery technology, whether it's electroporation, for instance, whether it's the ability to handle cells, and all that's coming together, which just speaks to the rapid pace of innovation that we live in today when it comes to cell and gene therapies. Uh, and we're very pleased with our partners, Vertex, to uh, have been able to file in both the US and in Europe uh, to bring XSL to patients. Great. And, and maybe just in terms of news flows and, and gating, uh, I, I guess, uh, events, what, what kind of news flow in Europe and, and in the U.S. in terms of approval dates, ad comms, uh, and, and uh, launches? Well, the key, uh, you know, I wouldn't say news flow, but, you know, the process after we file, you know, one of the um, important um, points in the process is obviously to, to get the uh, letter from the FDA saying that, you know, the, the filing is accepted. Uh, that's when you also find out whether you have... Uh, what your PDUFA date might be, uh, whether there's an ad com or not, and uh, all that will be coming forth in the next uh, few weeks. Uh, we'll update the market when we hear on that. Um, what we expect, you know, we, we, this is a rolling submission, and we've been working with the agency quite closely on account of the fact that we have RMAT designation, so we expect that things will flow smoothly. Um, but I think, you know, as we go along, we'll update. In Europe, I think, again, there's, you know, obviously there's questions back and forth that you get from regulators throughout the approval process uh, or the review process. Um, so I think, per se, that I would point to and say, this is where you're going to get an update. Um, but generally, I think um, both in the U.S. and Europe, on account of the fact that we started working with regulators very early, on account of the fact that we had all the designations that allow us to have that fluid dialogue, uh, we don't expect any surprises and we expect that things will move along. Although, you know, it's a very complicated filing package and everything else, and it's a new modality, we expect that things move along quite rapidly. Great. Uh, now, I'd like to switch gears maybe a little bit to your second maybe business segment, uh, immuno-oncology. Could you please explain how CRISPR approaches immuno-oncology with respect to, you know, maybe touching on allo versus auto, and also, um, you know, one-off treatments versus redosing, and, and, you know, maybe capacity to treat patients? Yeah, and you've been covering this for a while, ever since we started the immuno-oncology vertical. Uh, I'm convinced that cell therapies are going to have a very important role in immuno-oncology. Um, and, you know, I've talked to people who've been involved in oncology research for number of years. And if you think about it, the modern war on cancer was declared in the 60s. And we've gone through, cycled through a lot of toxic chemicals. We've cycled through uh, the first generation of antibodies and now the next generation of antibodies and ADCs. Uh, but we're really, you know, still when we think about cancer care, we still think about medicines that are highly toxic, uh, patients that, you know, have to live through a lot of pain, a lot of nausea, a lot of other side effects uh, while they take the medicine and you still don't get cures. Um, and I think with cell therapies, you may have a completely new way of approaching cancer medicine, which is to have relatively safe medicines that could provide complete and deep responses that could potentially lead to cure. Um, now, is it autologous therapies? Is it allogeneic? You know, I think we've seen some great success with autologous therapies, but it's not scalable. It's not it doesn't reach all the patients that deserve it. Um, I think allogeneic therapies are the way to go. And I think while there have been some hiccups with the first generation of efforts with allogeneic, the key here is to pick a thesis and persist. And that's what we've done. And now we have not just the first generation programs, but the second generation programs. And if I look back, you know, and say, what have we achieved over the last three or four years? You know, with CTX 110, we've shown that patients can go out to two plus, three plus years in complete response. With one shot of an allergenic cell therapy, you know, not, you know, weekly injections for a year with toxicity. Yeah. One shot of an allergenic cell therapy. That's pretty remarkable for that patient, you know, and for science in general to say we've been able to achieve that. What have we achieved in solid tumors? We achieved a complete response in a third line RCC, mm -hmm. which, is in, which even PD-1s have not been able to achieve, mm -hmm. right? Um, and I think, you know, if you look at first line PD-1 data, you're at 9, 10% complete response rate. And so it just tells you what the potential is of cell therapies, and that's why we're moving forward 110 and 130 quite rapidly. And it's further substantiated by the fact that, you know, regulators are very supportive, but with, with the RMAT designation we have, um, 
you know, at various conferences like EVMT, we had the presidential symposium recently for 110. You know, investigators and regulators are highly, highly supportive of a therapy like this because it can reach all the patients that deserve cell therapies in community settings. Uh, it's relatively safe for the patients. Uh, and we're going to get to a point where it's a no-brainer to try cell therapies first mm -hmm. and see what happens before you expose the patient to any toxic uh, regimens beyond that. Great. And maybe talk about uh, 110. Um, where, where, what's the latest and greatest update here and, and where, how close are we to defining a patient population for, you know, commercially um, uh, relevant population and, and for uh, pivotal development? Yeah, I think, we, you know, what we said is we're, we're in a trial that put, could be potentially registrational, and this is in DLBCL uh, third line, where patients have gone through therapies like RCHOP, they've gone through um, other options, some of them have gone through transplants. Um, and, and what we're seeing is, you know, reasonable durability of responses in, in these patients with single dose of, of CTX-110, and now what we're doing is developing with two doses of CTX-110. And the idea behind that is I think the second dose will consolidate any remaining cancer cells that are still present in the body. And the patients have shown, you know, it's been shown that for patients, the safety profile is no different with two doses of LD chemo versus one. Um, so I think, you know, at this point, we're trying to move that forward as quickly as we can uh, to registration. Uh, we're moving forward 130, which is targeting CD70 mm -hmm. in T cell lymphomas quite rapidly. But then for solid tumors, what we did is go to the next generation CAR T, which has these very unique edits in Regnase 1 and TGF8 R2 that I think is going to imp improve the potency at least an order of magnitude, mm -hmm. if not more, than the first gens. And that's really important in solid tumors. Yeah. And, and about that, I, I think it's, it's a crucial point to point out because I think there's almost like different schools of thought around allo CAR Ts, and, and there's several of your competitors that are working on making more Im immunoevasive, oh, I mean, see, transparent, or how we want to call them. CAR Ts, right? So they're like either armored or they are invisible to the immune system. And for you, these edits are more uh, on the potency side. So, so it's, it's more about boosting the uh, the cell, the CAR Ts per tumor cell ratio, but also to making them more potent. Can you just comment on on what we've seen at AACR, maybe in terms of that that, that underlines that your strategy is valid here. Well, you know, take the you know at this point, we've dosed close to 200 patients with allogenic cell therapy. That's more than almost all the other allo companies combined. Um, so we have more experience in allogenic cell therapies. Um, and this includes data around what's happening in the tumor microenvironment, how are our cells doing. Um, and one important observation we had is that in solid tumors, the cells may be hanging around, the CAR-T may be hanging around the tumor, but they're not as active anymore because they've been exhausted. And that's because the tumor microenvironment has a number of factors that exhaust these CAR-Ts, and that's a resistance mechanism for the tumors. Um, so what we want is to dial up the potency of those CAR-Ts. And even if the CAR-Ts survive about a month, but they're highly potent, they can actually eliminate the tumor. So that's the, that's the thesis, which is, as you rightly pointed out, it's a little different from some competitors who are going after more of the stealth edits. And, you know, our take was, sure, if you can make the cells last longer, but they're not potent, you know, it may not mean much in terms of potency or in terms of durability of responses. Great. Uh, so maybe talking about that, the CAR T CTX one twelve, which is the next gen, has moved into the clinic. Um, when do you think uh, we'll be ready for some data, and, and what do you think will be a meaningful improvement from these extra edits? That, that, that yeah, I, you know, we're really excited to have started, you know, enrolling patients with CTX one twelve that we just announced, and um, you know, we haven't said when we're going to disclose the data, but we'll mm -hmm. start accruing data. Yeah. You know, we want to get to past dose level one because I think at dose level two and three, that's where you're going to start seeing a lot of activity, but. Um, even before we disclose clinical data on patients, what we're looking for internally is what does the expansion profile look like of these CAR Ts? Mm -hmm. What are the PKPD dynamics relative to the CTX-110? If it turns out these cells are expanding a lot more, if these cells are active, um, you know, beyond day 14, day 15, um, they retain more of the naive phenotype, they're more central memory phenotype, that's going to give us a lot of confidence that this is going to be better than the first generation. And those are all data we're going to be seeing in the next, you know, four to five months, uh, so before the end of this year. Now, we haven't decided whether we're going to disclose it or not, yeah. but we're going to have that data. Uh, in fact, that's one of the things that's happening is, you know, I think Pharma knows that we're going to have those those data, and that for, for them, they'd rather not wait until we disclose all the clinical data, and so there's a lot of uh, inbound interest around these preclinical data. Um, now, particularly more since there's a publication by Carl June mm -hmm. uh, last month uh, in PNAS with the same edit that we're doing, which is Regnase 1, and uh, that's ignited a lot of interest around this particular target, which I do think is going to be one of the most important targets in mean, oncology similar to a PD-1 in the coming years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. And I guess similar for CTX-130, you're already in the clinic with 131. Um, here again, the solid tumor is probably more challenging. Uh, again, you, you already started dosing patients, I believe. Um, what, what's, the, what's the bar here for you internally? I think we had one, one out of five patients on, on the predecessor CAR-T. Um, is response rate something that we want to look for, or is, again, is it some of these other more earlier measures that you look for? Well, ultimately, we want to see what response rate yeah. rates are, and we want to see, you know, how many patients get either have a partial response or a complete response. And mind you, this is for patients that have no options left. You know, they've exhausted the PD-1 therapies, they've exhausted all the TKIs, 
and they're at this point where they, you know, a lot of them going to salvage kind of care or going to palliative therapy. Um, so if you see any responses, that's pretty meaningful. You know, we had a patient visit us recently um, who had a long stable disease in our 130 trial, mm -hmm. right? And so, you know, most investors say, okay, stable disease doesn't count as a response. But, you know, this patient thought they're not going to have any time to get their affairs in order. Mm -hmm. And instead, they had, you know, close to a year to do, you know, to plan for their family. And in fact, one of them wanted to attend, you know, be there for his daughter's wedding. Mm -hmm. And all this matters for patients. And I think, you know, people always take sort of this numerical view of patient care. And having a safe therapy that gives you that extension of life, a quality of life towards the end, I think really matters. But, but what we're aiming for is, you know, even more to get the responses and get a reasonable number of responses that allow us to move, not just establish our position in third line, but move forward to earlier lines of therapy in, in indications like renal cell carcinoma. Mm -hmm. And uh, CTX-130, obviously, it was not only in, in solid tumors, but also in a liquid tumor uh, in, in maybe a smaller setting, but, but uh, difficult to treat with a CAR-T setting uh, because of fratricide. So could you tell us what's, what's kind of like the path forward there and, and how fast could we uh, get to people? To no, I think we've solved the fratricide issue. I think we knock out CD70 mm -hmm. in these CAR-Ts so that we can actually manufacture without fratricide. Um, and that was one of the keys to be able to manufacture a sufficient amount of doses to not just supply these clinical trials, but to make it economically feasible where you still have a pretty attractive gross margin. Mm -hmm. And so we've done all that. And in fact, you know, we're very proud of uh, getting our own manufacturing facility online now where we can produce uh, these CAR-Ts um, very efficiently, very flexibly. Uh, we won the uh, FOIA award for the best manufacturing facility. It was called the Facility of the Year mm -hmm. award. And uh, last year, we won the best manufacturing facility in uh, biopharma. Normally, it's big pharma that win these facility awards, but we have such a state-of-the-art facility that's designed in a bespoke fashion for cell therapies, for mRNA, for AAVs, and everything else in a 65,000 square foot facility, which is quite remarkable. So I think being able to do that solves the issues like fratricide you're mentioning, but also be able to supply not just for patients in the US and maybe Europe, but across the world. Mm -hmm. And maybe think a big picture, you have a lot of cash, uh, you have a lot of capabilities, <clears throat> but you also have a lot of uh, different segments, right? You have uh, hemoglobinopathies, obviously partner of the vertex, but then you're going into in vivo, you have uh, diabetes. Um, how, how, how much CAR-T can you move forward into late-stage development? And, and, and you mentioned partnering a little bit earlier. What are some of the strategic thinking around how to manage that? Well, I think what we're doing as a builder company is a bit modular in a way. We're, we're building franchise by franchise. So we have our hemoglobinopathies franchise, which now, in a way, is profitable on its own, right? We, you know, we, we don't have to expend a lot of money on that franchise. Everything goes well, and that becomes a profit, profitable franchise. That's going to be profitable for years to come and grow. We then have our immuno oncology franchise, which I think we want to get to that same point. Once we get the first one or two products uh, to filing or to approval, mm -hmm. that'll pay. You know, that'll continue paying for itself in terms of research, and we can do more. Uh, we now have the diabetes franchise, where we're partnered with Vertex, and we're continuing to enroll patients there. Mm -hmm. And then we have the in vivo franchise, uh, where we're going to be in the clinic relatively soon. And beyond all this, the base of all this is our platform improvements and our fundamental research, and that's we're calling that CRISPR X. You know, so we kind of build the company within a company. You know, I, I think what happens when you companies start maturing is that um, some of the same people who innovate in a smaller company setting, you kind of lose that in a bigger company setting. So we created a company within a company called CRISPR-X that are incentives slightly differently from everyone else. And those people are working on, you know, new generation editing technologies. They're working on LNP delivery for different in tissues. And all that feeds into the different franchises, mm -hmm. right? So, yes, we have a lot on our plate, but we have a strong balance sheet and we don't have to make any immediate decisions uh, on partnering or not partnering at this point. I think for our in vivo programs, for instance, once we have data for five to 10 patients, that's where we would consider partnering. We don't, we don't need to rush into it now where we give away value. Mm -hmm. um, diabetes, you know, we'll have data from our program, but also Vertex uh, have data from their programs. And we actually, by giving them a technology license, have some interest and stake in, in what they're doing as well mm -hmm. and with their edited programs. So I think all in all, what we want to do is make sure each of the franchises have created sufficient enterprise value. There's step change enterprise value at every um, with a clear view of what, what the growth is for that franchise. Um, and that model of operating has worked well for us as a company. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, maybe talking about the diabetes uh, franchise, uh, you already moved on to dosing the next uh, generation uh, that may actually have some uh, efficacy. What would be your first data disclosure look like and, and what are kind of like the gating values that we want to see to, to move this forward? Yeah, well, I mean, that's the other thing. You know, I think if I put this all in perspective of biomedical history, it's quite amazing that we have not just one, but two generations of stem cell derived products mm -hmm. with edits that are going into patients, mm -hmm. right? If you, you know, when in 20, in the late, uh, in the first decade of the, of the century, you know, there were a lot of discussion about embryonic stem cells, people moved to iPS cells and there were a lot of research and it gave rise to a whole new generation of cell types that you could produce or differentiate from iPS or from stem cells. That led to the Nobel Prize for Dr. Yamanaka in 2012. Um, 
but it was kind of a cottage industry in a way with Regen Med. You know, people were doing efforts, there were efforts in Japan, there were efforts in California supported by CIRM. And what we've done is harness all that, the development of Regen Med, with CRISPR to be the first in the world to dose patients with edited stem cell derived products. That's the first in the world. Um, I think it kind of gets lost with all the, you know, when we talk to investors, we often talk about Exocell, we don't talk about some of the other things we're doing, but uh, this is well ahead of anyone else in terms of having edited cells going into patients. And so we'll see data from that. Um, and that could be transformative, which is, you know, diabetes is a huge market, needless to say. Uh, but this opens up the notion that we can take edited cells to produce any factors in the body. You know, so we, don't, we may not need to dose patients with antibodies in the future. We can just implant them with cells that are producing um, TNF-alpha antibodies or producing other antibodies. You know, you could have people with autoimmune diseases where they're, they don't have to dose themselves all the time. And that just, that notion of cellular biofactories within the patient, it's a pretty powerful concept. Um, and I think, you know, there's, people are talking about all sorts of concepts now. They're talking about GLP-1s mm -hmm. being produced by cells inside patients. Uh, you know, in a regulated fashion. You know, it's one thing to take these drugs like Ozempic um, or Rigovi with, you know, regular schedule, but what you really want is the glip ones or GIP ones to be produced in, in response to meals or in response to glucose. Uh, so, so you just are entering a new horizon for cell and gene therapies. You know, if I look at some of the early research we're doing, it's mind-blowing. You know, I think we can do organ-specific expression of peptides or proteins in response to metabolic circuits. We can do epigenetic editing to tune down expression or tune down production versus shutting it off. Uh, we can do correction, both long and short. Um, and I think we're just, you know, gonna see a next huge wave of applications come up, whether it's autoimmune, whether it's um, in, in the form of, you know, uh, metabolic circuits, uh, um, what have you. And uh, all that's gonna come through in the next uh, two, three years, I think. Yeah, that's very exciting. Um, unfortunately, we're out of running out of time here, but um, uh, with that, I'll, I'll thank you very much for joining us today. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah.